Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Julie Sorelli, Editorial Director of Harvard Design Magazine, and I am joined in welcoming you by our two guest editors, Sarah Whiting and Rahul Marotra. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. A quick reminder that we also have closed captioning available. To enable captions, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of your live stream window. So thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to share a first look or sneak peek at our forthcoming issue. Um, it'll be a ma mailed to subscribers and in bookstores, hopefully by the end of May. And we'll soon have a limited number of copies available for pre-order. Pre so my colleague is gonna drop a link into the stream where you can register your interests and receive a 20% off discount code. Um, Meg, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, this afternoon, we will be hosting a conversation between our guest editors and three of our contributors. We are truly honored to have such auspicious guests here to celebrate 50 issues of Harvard Design Magazine. The theme of our issue and of today's conversation is today's global. And our guests will be discussing global design discourse as it relates to a sense of place and placemaking political identity, and the impact of globalization on design pedagogy. We have with us Chris Lee of Siri Architects in London, Mumbai, and Singapore. Chris is also a critic here at the GSC. Anel de Plessis, chairholder of the South African Research Chair in Cities, Law, and Environmental Sustainability, and faculty of law at the Northwest University in South Africa. And New York-based architecture critic, Nikolai Orosov, who is also currently completing a book about architecture, politics, and culture that is forthcoming from Farrar Strauss and Giroux. For many of you, our guest editors need very little introduction. Sarah Whiting is Dean and Joseph Louis Cerf, Professor of Architecture here at the GSC and the design principal and co-founder of WW Architecture. Prior to coming to the GSC, she served as Dean of Rice University School of Architecture from 2010 until 2019. Rahul Marotra is chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, the John T. Dunlap Professor in Housing and Urbanization, Director of the Master in Architecture and Urban Design degree program, and co-director of the Master of Landscape Architecture in Urban Design degree program. He is a practicing architect and urban designer in, with his Mumbai and Boston-based firm, RMA Architects. Before I hand things over to Sarah and Rahul, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has been working behind the scenes to make this issue possible. Our editors, contributors, and staff, this is a, a timely and gorgeous issue, and I feel that it's one of our best so far. I'd especially like to acknowledge the dedication and work of my colleague and right hand um, publication manager Meg Sandberg and our brilliant copy editor Rachel Holtzman. I'd also like to thank Ken Stewart, Assistant Dean of Communications and Public Programs, and Chad Klepp for our in-house art director, and of course our amazing Copenhagen-based design team, Alexis Mark. I'll also invite you to join us for an upcoming GSD public program on Thursday, April 21st at 6.30 p.m., join us for a lecture by Stephanie Brew and Alexander Thoreau, founders of the Paris-based firm Bruthen. More information is available on the GSD website for that one. Thank you so very much again for being here. Um, here's Sarah and Rahul. Um, thank you so much, uh, Julie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so I'm Sarah, that's Rahul. I think you can figure that out. Um, uh, we really want to thank first um, Julie, uh, as well as uh, Meg and all the people that, that Julie thanked. Um, I also want to thank Matt Smith, Paige Johnston, and Kat Chavez, who have helped bring this event together uh, from our events team. 
Um, and then I want to thank all the contributors. So um, Rahul, I just did a, a quick count and figured out that we have 48 contributors plus the two of us makes it 50. Do you think we did that uh, on purpose? I mean, that's sort of amazing. Um, so this is issue number 50 of the Harvard Design Magazine. And um, it was I, a real pleasure uh, for me to work with Rahul on um, putting this issue together and, and assembling it. Um, Rahul and I graduated from school roughly around the same time. I won't say which one of us is older, um, but we, we graduated at a time when it was a real transition uh, in the recent history of globalization. We graduated essentially right at that cusp when the, let's say the glamorous moment of globalization was being called into question. And that's part of what got us interested in this topic of the global today. So if you think of the um, period, so we graduated at the very end of the 80s. Um, and if you think of the period that preceded that, it was a moment of <clears throat> incredible international expansion. The world had become smaller through things like the Concorde, which um, got you to Europe in a matter of hours, or the beginning of global networks that allowed us to be connected. The internet was invented in 1989. And so the world had really sort of just really become this um, hyper-connected, uh, uh, unbelievable place. And right in, in, in 1989, you then started having things like the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the sort of idea of, of a moment when it seemed like the world was uniting as one. Now, um, with decades of hindsight, we've been able to see sort of that the promise of this moment, this transitional moment, um, uh, was pretty quickly called into question and um, challenges to this, this kind of rosy picture of world unity and, and uh, connectivity, uh, the, the underbelly of this has, um, has sort of come into focus, let's say. And so that's, that's been part of the um, interest in our drawing attention to this, this topic of the global today, which of course, with um, events in Ukraine, um, with the pandemic, uh, with uh, global attention to issues of structural racism has, has also entered a new phase of urgency. But let me, let me, this is a, a highly informal event, I will note, despite the fact that we're all separated into our clean Zoom boxes. And so let me turn the mic over to Rahul, who's going to chime in as well. We're going to go sort of back and forth on this intro. So Rahul, go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Sarah, for thanking everyone we had to thank. So I won't repeat myself, but just reinforce that and, and the sentiment that this has been a very enjoyable uh, process. I didn't realize it was 50 contributors. That's, that's divine alignment. So I think uh, that's great too. And I think the, the array of people who've contributed to these conversations, and we've, we really look at them as conversations because to come up with an answer about how to read the global today is hard. And, and therefore what we've tried to do is kind of nuance it or complicate it in ways that it can be a much more inclusive discussion. Uh, we've also, you know, uh, I think included, well, we've really struggled to uh, see how we can find rubrics that make it productive for us as designers. I mean, we speak from the perspective of a design and a professional school uh, and how we maybe construct other formations besides the national uh, to think and look at how we can be productive participants uh, in the present condition and informing it, intervening it in it more responsibly, et cetera. So besides the kinds of issues that Sarah has sort of outlined, we've also uh, tried to look at the legacies and interrogate uh, the construction of these legacies in the past, you know, all the way from the third world, which started off as an optimistic vision of an alternative to the first and the second, but slipped very quickly into the binary of being an underdeveloped kind of place. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and what that has sort of meant, uh, but also, you know, what the global North and South means, uh, what are alternate ways of looking at this, even histories of, of, of uh, the history of international organizations uh, that have participated 
or facilitated the process of global flows even before capital of intellectual capital, let's say, uh, which uh, one of our contributors has sort of really um, elaborated on calling them the alternate global regimes that bridged institutional and grassroots organizations across the world. So there are histories that have facilitated this process of globalization. We seem to have settled on global finance and began to only interrogate that. Uh, and I think we've tried to broaden the conversation because we feel as designers uh, to look for what might be other forms of patronage, uh, what might be other issues. One of the rubrics we've sort of introduced uh, borrowing from Shahidu Alam, who is a wonderful photographer from Bangladesh and a, a piece about him and his work, uh, where he calls it the majority world, which is the global south, where a majority of the world's population resides. And that sort of actually nuances the uh, imagination of the global world as being beyond finance to demographic movements and shifts to economic to going beyond economies to culture to social questions uh, but using really the human being as the metric then uh, i think of affords another imagination so that's a kind of range of nuances that we've tried to introduce in i think what we both call conversations about the global today Exactly. And I think, I mean, it's obviously this is a topic that we could never be comprehensive about. I think all of the Harvard Design Magazine topics are such large topics that invite conversation and incite conversation. We have, we do have a remarkable range of contributors who include practitioners, historians, policymakers, um, uh, uh, writers, and and uh, so it, the, the, there's a richness to the approach from these different angles, and and also includes people from different parts of the globe, um, and I, I think that that's um, incredibly important. We're we're joined today by um, three of our contributors, so a, a practitioner, a writer, and a, a lawyer. Um, it's always a little nerve wracking to invite a lawyer into your design mix, but um, but we, we feel the attention to policy is obviously incredibly um, important in this issue. And just the question of how do you regulate um, a world that, that doesn't necessarily, with so many issues that don't necessarily respect boundaries. And so climate, the climate crisis is one of them, but, but other modes of um, human existence don't necessarily um, uh, hold to geographic boundaries. And so issues of policy and law are actually incredibly integral to this topic. So we're, we're gonna launch our discussion. The way this is gonna work is we, we gave three prompts of uh, questions to our, our speakers. And we are going to, um, uh, we'll, we'll tell you what those questions are. We're, and then um, Chris Lee will start, Nikolai Orsov will, will um, follow, and Anel de Plessis will, will be the third. Um, and then we'll have a, a brief conversation among the five of us, and then we'll open it up to question and answer. So if you have questions, you should put them in the Q&A of the, the format. And so the first, the first question that we gave this group was, of course, many questions built into one, um, because it's always hard to limit yourself. And so the, the first question was, um, the, the global design imaginary has tended to render design's relationship to place in extreme terms. On the one hand, the global has a race place altogether, suggesting that contemporary design is continuous across the globe. And so, you know, think of the fact that you see a Starbucks in every city, and frankly, it looks pretty much the same. On the other hand, globalization has led to a nostalgia or fetishization of the hyperlocal. So you have these two extremes. Climate considerations have perhaps recently introduced some degree of nuance into this extreme spectrum. What other strategies, narratives, or policies, whether historic, contemporary, or not yet extant, do you see emerging to help further design's relationship to place? So that was our first question. Rahul, why don't you jump in with the second? Oh, you're muted. The se Sorry, the second one was really an obvious one, a theme that really runs through the entire issue, not surprisingly, which is the dominance of neoliberalism in defining the global design imaginary, uh, capital finance. And from that, the question was really, what forms of patronage, political alignments, and or policies 
again, historic, contemporary, or not yet extant uh, models might offer alternate options in neoliberalism's homogeneous flattening for today's global. And then our third question was uh, an obvious question for us coming from the GSD, which is what are the impacts of globalization on design pedagogy? So we teach in a school that has students coming from 62 different countries. We work on topics all over the world. How might globalization impact design pedagogy? How might the academy negotiate the local and the global for the next generation? So those were our um, three prompts for generating this initial conversation among, among the five of us. And I think what we're going to do is start with um, handing the Zoom mic over to Chris Lee. And, um, and Chris, you can take us into your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, Rahul, uh, for inviting me. So this is a, a real pleasure uh, to, to be part of. So I'll, I'll just jump straight into uh, my presentation. Um, okay, uh, I've dutifully prepared uh, slides, so I'll try to finish this uh, um, in, in, in the time given uh, in eight minutes. So uh, with regards to the first uh, problem or the first question uh, is with regards to designs, uh, designs relation to place, I felt that uh, implicit in this question uh, is the desire uh, for architecture to be contextually relevant. So, but I also think that this ought to go beyond the need for buildings that look aesthetically harmonious in their context or that merge seamlessly to a place. Because when design has a deep relationship to place, I see it first as an architecture that can accommodate the cultural, social, economic, and political life of a place. A building may look contextually pliant, but if it is exclusionary, it will have no value to its host. So this criteria for accommodation, I would feel, I feel deviates from Frampton's critical regionalism that champion architects that can be modern and yet close to their roots. Frampton's preferred examples are those that emphasize the tectonic and aesthetic dimension of the architectural object above other consideration. So I see two paths that can harness uh, architecture's propensity for accommodation. So the first is through the idea of the city as a space of coexistence alongside its architecture that makes this possible. A good example is this page that I took out from Ross's uh, Architecture of the City, 1963. Um, and, and later uh, translated uh, in the 80s by opposition, where he argued that an urban artifact is one that continues to evolve with the life of the city through constant alteration and accommodation whilst retaining its irreducible structure, thereby being familiar to its citizens. So learning from this, if we can detect these structures in a contemporary city, draw their lessons and redeploy them through selection and abstraction, then we are closer to creating an architecture that can act as a common framework tied to its place. Now, the second path can be found in our response to climate change linked to the reduction of, uh, linked to the, uh, uh, the, re the attempt to reduce a building's carbon footprint. So this necessitates that a building consumes the minimum, minimal amount of energy in its use and in its making. We will see therefore less of this sort of climatically agnostic corporate glass towers uh, that we see for the past couple of decades and more of architecture that has a thermal relationship with its surroundings building that keeps the heat out and breathe more in the tropics and buildings that keep the heat in and breathe less in the temperate climate. And also buildings will also be tied closer to their place by the proximity of available building materials, bridging the economy of building construction to the expression of local material. With regards to the second question, uh, options to neoliberal homogeneous flattening of today's global, I contend that the dominance of neoliberalism rests on the promise of progress and modernization through economic expansion and technological innovation for the for past several decades. And therefore, it is not surprising that the architecture of star architects of late embodied this assertion. They are monuments that require the marshalling of large capital available only through borderless accumulation to fund them and the deployment of the latest building and design technology to design them and to build them. 
that globalization tended to favor the elites led by the West is now obvious and the discontent that follows unsurprising. So to argue for the persistence of a global design imaginary supposes, the, supposes still that the importance of global connectedness and cooperation, which is right because this is necessary as the challenges that the world faces cannot be solved by nation states working in isolation. So for this to continue, an inclusive understanding of the global and its raison d'etre must be reconstructed. This inevitably rests not only on economics and technology, but on politics, economics, culture, status, psychology, morality, and, re and religion all at once. So as the uh, Eaglehart Wilsel World Cultural Map 2020 shows, the Anglo-Saxon and Protestant European spheres, known as the Western spheres, are actually cultural outliers. And in the center, bridging the poles are Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, and South Africa. Unsurprisingly, former colonies of Western imperialism straddling multiple identities and value system. So this shift from a material to a value system in an increasingly bipolar, uh, uh, in an increasingly multipolar or bipolar world, judging from recent atrocities, can proceed in two ways. As a struggle between the, the West's emphasis on personal dignity and much of the rest of the world's emphasis on communal, as David Brooks recently argues, or for a peaceful and competitive accommodation based on a heightened awareness of multiple cultural, philosophical, and political paradigms, one in which we must get our heads around. And my response to the third uh, question naturally flows uh, from the first and second with regards to pedagogy. So how, how might we, uh, might the, uh, the academy negotiate the local and global for the next generation? So I have five suggestions. Some of them actually have been highlighted by Mark Jasenbeck. Um, and that we should not, uh, and, and my five proposition is that one, is that we should not only teach from a Eurocentric platform, Two, neither should we teach non-Eurocentric non platforms from an oriental perspective as the other, the contrasting image, idea, personality and experience of Europe or the West. Third is that architecture of the world should be thought and understood in their own cultural, social and political context and frame through a global perspective, emphasizing their interconnectedness with other narratives of the world. And lastly, uh, more practical terms, uh, more immediate perhaps, any global design studio should focus not on exotic sites, but on the content of globalization, i.e. the processes and challenges that accompany the production of architecture in a connected globalized world. Um, I will stop here and I I'll hand it over to Nikolai. Um, thank you, Earl. That was interesting, actually. And it's nice to see such optimism because I think, um, as Sarah knows, I've, I've, I've become very pes pessimistic about the idea of globalization um, and its impact on architecture in particular. Um, I think it's worth stepping back for a moment and remembering that the whole idea that architecture could serve um, ordinary people is, is very new. It really begins with the utopian socialists um, um, at the beginning of um, the 19th century. It was a response to the growth of the very beginnings of capitalism. Until then, architecture was almost very closely allied to power. And so in some ways, I think we're in a situation that um, where we're beginning to feel um, as though um, there's a certain period in architecture that maybe feels as though somehow it's coming to an end. And that period is bracketed by um, the early 19th century and the last 20 years and the rise of a, of a kind of feral neoliberal order, which obviously will come up again over and over, I mean, uh, in this conversation. I think that um, that period of optimism, um, not surprisingly, um, reached its apogee probably in the... Um, economic anomaly of the trente glorias that Piketty focuses on when there was a, uh, a strong middle class and the disparity between um, rich and poor um, was less than it had ever been in human history. Um, and it, I think it's not surprising that um, those political and economic conditions 
um, produced a moment when modernism, whatever other issues we may have with it, felt as though it really engaged the lives of ordinary people um, um, from the middle class house, the case study programs to uh, larger urban projects like Brasilia. But it was engaged with uh, the social dimension in a way that um, at least when I was growing up seemed to be what architecture was about. Um, and in the last 20 years of my life seems to have become more and more marginal. Um, when I was a student at Columbia, Sarah uh, mentions 1989, and I started um, um, in architecture school at Columbia in 1989, and I started working um, as a critic in 91 um, at the moment, a few months before um, the Berlin Wall, wall fell. Uh, sorry, the Soviet Union collapsed um, and the beginning of the internet, um, which seemed to be um, for us, I think, uh, a moment that was still full of promise uh, and an opening up of possibilities, um, even if um, the social dimension of architecture, the idea that architecture could function as an agent of social change, uh, seemed to have dissipated with the fall of modernism. There was still a sense that architects could uh, offer a kind of um, form of resistance to whatever the dominant social, political, economic system was. And I think that continues through the unipolar moment um, uh, after the fall of communism um, and the first decade or so of this next period of globalization, um, when it seemed as though there were still corners of the world where you could operate uh, in creative ways um, and against the status quo. and and um, I'm trying not to be completely pessimistic about this because Sarah is always writing me about it, but I think what you see in the last 20 years is the closing down of those spaces. And the most obvious place is in the, um, ironically, the, um, the global capitals, uh, the great metropolises that where modernism was originally born in places like Berlin, New York, and London. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk about a little bit, which is maybe less noted, is the way this has become entangled with a breakdown between not so much the universal and the local, um, but a kind of matrix of global cities that um, draw almost all of our um, financial um, creative and intellectual resources um, and a kind of uh, marginal or rather the, the vast majority of the world where um, the kinds of interventions that are possible tend to function almost as a form of charity. Um, so that if you think about, for example, um, the first time I really came across this was with Saudi Art Island in um, the UAE where you have um, say Jean Nouvel's um, Louvre, which I think as a work of architecture, isolated from its context is quite a convincing building, um, especially in the way it engages technology, modernity and the traditions of the region. Um, um, but it's embedded in an idea of uh, globalism that's uh, limited to a kind of a certain global elite that's forming alliances across national boundaries um, at the same time that um, it's building new barriers between those same elites and the majority of the population. And, I, and, and, and this has been as true in the cities of the West as it is in autocracies in the Middle East. Because if you look at the city I'm sitting in right now, um, um, projects like Hudson Yards, other large scale developments such as um, ground zero are pretty much now completely determined um, by market forces. Every decision is seen through the lens of the market and there's very little room for architectural experimentation, creativity or alternate, alternate models to, aver, uh, to emerge that could start to um, point in a new direction. Um, that's more inclusive and maybe more open. 
Um, on a positive note, I think that what's happened in the last five to 10 years is you've seen this kind of counter argument growing, um, where on the one hand, um, a generation of architects who've fought very hard to re-engage the social dimension of architecture um, have been able to intervene in at least small ways um, in areas that tend to be outside of this global matrix. So if you think of uh, Francis Carré working in um, Africa, or if you think of the work that um, Lakaton Vassal has been, have been able to do in working closely with municipal governments um, in what was once called the Red Ring outside of Paris or in um, Saint-Nazaire, and building up relationships slowly over time. Or if you look at the work that um, Xi Tian has done in rural China, a similar kind of model um, where it's possible to develop um, a different kind of argument, a different kind of view of community and architecture um, on a limited scale. Um, but I think that um, it's becoming clear as time goes on um, that it's going to be impossible to deal with the kinds of issues um, that this period of late period of globalization has raised, especially in terms of climate change um, and the um, displacement of people that it's going to cause, the social disruptions that it's going to cause um, from war to climate migrants and everything else. Um, things that we're already starting to see. Unless um, architects um, begin to engage on a political level. Um, and that means, I think, um, very briefly, um, not to take up too much time, but one, um, breaking out of um, this kind of insular, uh, sometimes insular um, kind of academy um, um, uh, that hides behind a certain kind of jargon about public space and things like that. And it means forming alliances, I think, um, both um, outside the profession and inside the profession, um, especially with those who have experienced modernity from, uh, I guess one way to put it is from the other end of a gun and have therefore understood it in ways that um, we're only beginning to understand in the West. Um, some of that is already happening. Um, and I think that the kind of the foundations of that are already there. Um, but obviously, I think um, it's going to be difficult unless there can be some kind of political movement um, to support it. So um, I'm trying to end this on a kind of more positive note, but um, I think I'll end it there and, and we can talk about the positives in the question and answer session. Thank you. This is indeed one of the challenges of uh, global connectivity is our assumption that we can always be connected. Anel is uh, dialing in from a, a fairly remote area in South Africa. And so we knew that her connection might drop out. And so we'll pick her up back when she comes back. Um, so Nikolai and Chris, if you can turn your uh, cameras back on and, and join us, that would be great. This, I think, is already a really provocative um, start, and I appreciate your uh, contributions. I, I was um, intrigued by um, your your comment, uh, Nikolai, that I, the idea that, that there was this period of modernism that engaged ordinary people and through a social dimension. And that was sort of a promise of early modernism that I think was real. And I think it's important to point that out. And I think that that ties in, in part, um, Chris, to your um, suggestion that, that um, architecture today will has to move away from these glass boxes and have a certain um, uh, regional um, uh, uh, let's say, um, articulation through materials and through thermal relationships. And I wondered if you can both um, really answer the question of whether the ordinary, which I think you both point to in a way, needs to be visibly identifiable as such.
Chris, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? I mean, I yeah, think, please I go, think, go ahead. Nicola, I, I, please. I think that there's an issue also of this separation between, which is, all, is, is you know, we're obviously seeing the world break down, as Chris has pointed out, into these kind of competing ideologies in a way. One of the things that I think is really missing is a discussion about, you know, what my, you know, Ronald Reagan called the forgotten middle classes, but this sense that, and Tony Judd talks about this a lot, that the middle class was always the social glue between, um, you know, the poor and the wealthy, and that the dissolution of the middle class is one of the things that has split us as a society. David Brooks talks about this in different ways also a lot. And I think that architecture, in a way, interestingly, also has lost its focus on um, the social sphere that could be used to glue these different groups back together. Now, Hofstetter said something that I read recently that was really interesting to me, which is that you can really judge a society in terms of whether the middle class looks up and strives towards at the, the upper classes or whether it identifies with the lower working classes and the suffering. You're saying, no, that makes a lot of sense. And and one could argue that there's the, a real disappearance of the middle class um, today. I'm going to hold on this uh, for a second because Anel is back. And so we're going to mm -hmm. turn to Anel to give her presentation. Then we'll return to this question and more. So Anel, welcome back. The rest of us will turn our cameras off and um, give you the stage. Thank you again. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, Sarah said at the very beginning, um, I am not a design scholar in the traditional sense of the word, um, but as a scholar of law and governance, um, I'm acutely aware of two things um, in response to the first question that was asked. And the first is that designers are bound by institutional boundaries, legal controls, and the often uninspiring vision, if I may, of people in power. And that secondly, law and policy over time design the living space of millions of people born and yet to be born. Um, and South Africa, where I'm from and where I'm at and right now, um, is perhaps one of the best examples that we have of a historic law and policy framework that 25 years into democratic um, change still continue to entrench spatial inequalities and spatial division. And um, some of you may recall that rather unsettling um, aerial shot of Johannesburg on the cover of Time magazine not too long ago. So with this in mind, I would say that yes, globalization erases place amongst the privileged elite and in the pockets of space where money um, consumerism and lavishness rule. But in the African context, we see as a result of many factors of which historical institutional dispensations, be it colonization or apartheid. So I was referring to informality as a, as a designer in, in the African context. And I think that it's not unique to Africa, but that we need to note that it may be aggressively be designing many a city and town in the entire developing world right now. I also think that in many parts of the world where the urban and the rural are moving closer to each other, spatially and in terms of path dependencies, um, as such as, as, as food chains, and where the rural interlands retained its local design flavor for much longer than the urban areas, we may see design of a hybrid kind where urban space on the boundary may at least for a short while embrace the face, culture and style of living, even if it's staged, of more rural communities such as farming communities. The greenish idea of buy local, use local labor, etc., may of course also feed into this in some way or the other. So in a country such as South Africa, there is also something to be said for a heavily tourism dependent economy, where visitors from elsewhere, be they visiting our cities, towns, or national parks with the big five, want to experience the local flavor in terms of wining and dining, entertainment, but definitely also in the experience of space. 
its design, its upkeep, the way in which it captures heritage and culture, and the way in which it helps to tell the story of the place and the generations of people who lived and moved through it. So on the second question that you asked, um, I would like to say that one of the features of neoliberalism is deregulation and reduced government spending. And this definitely feeds into the homogeneous flattening of today's global, in my view. Um, as my contribution to the magazine explains, um, we are with, witnessing, or perhaps rather experiencing, a collapse of basic municipal service delivery um, across South Africa at the moment. And this speaks to a collapse of local government in the majority of cities and towns, and definitely not only in informal settlements adjacent to the Johannesburgs and the Cape Towns and the Durbans. It affects literally everyone in the country. And as I speak to you this evening, we had a total of four hours of so-called load shedding in South Africa today. Where due to electricity infrastructure not being able to carry demand, the country runs on a schedule where your area is without electricity for a specified time. This year is the 15th year since load shedding started in South Africa. The economic impact continues to be immense. But perhaps most relevant from a design perspective is that this has led to inevitable design changes in terms of the built environment in a sea of, in my view, quite unsightly, but much needed buildings, uh, solar power infrastructure. So in many instances, industrial sites and buildings had to be altered significantly to allow the picture of often extensive solar power installations. This is an example of how urgency and basic needs may trump any aesthetic or other creative approach to design. I guess there are many other examples of this from different parts of the world. Because of the local government collapse in South Africa, we see the private sector stepping in, and there's no surprise in there, and, and others alluded to. But it also means that those in public power, those who have been democratically elected to represent the interests and to protect the rights of local community members are losing their power. There is a subtle element of deregulation. We have a legal construct or a doctrine here, and it actually comes from US law, namely that of the public trust, which means that all natural resources and cultural heritage are part of a trust that must be carefully administered by the state or the government to the benefit of every single person in the country, as well as to the benefit of children still to be born. And the trust beneficiaries are intergenerational. But there is no concomitant trust doctrine holding the private sector to account. So unless businesses and investors have a vested interest in designing and upkeeping local space in a way that embraces the local, it will fall prey. Okay, um, let's let's um, come back as our discussion, and uh, Anel can join us in the in the discussion. So, uh, excellent. So, uh, Anel, you can you can join us in the in the discussion. Um, so, I wanted to. Uh, I mean, it's it's super interesting to me to actually include the regulatory and I think Anel's comments about the the um, space between the rural and the urban is um, incredibly that's incredibly relevant right now, um, and and I'd, I'd love to get dive into this question of public trust, which I think um, is is a. Uh, um, this idea of actually designing even for the future generations um, is a degree of optimism, Nikolai. I'm going to hold on to um, uh, the need for optimism. Um, but let's let's return for now to this um, question of the middle class and the and the ordinary. So um, Nikolai had started answering that, and um, I don't know if you want to turn the mic back over to Chris now. Yeah, Sarah. I, I think your your question was was alluding to. Um, materials relation to to a context yeah and and i think and i think I, I i agree i think that that is why i also argued as such i think uh we could we could say that um let's say prior to the shipping container um 
most architecture uh, or most architecture of the city uh, will look and feel like the ground on which it rose uh, up from, right? Um, most of uh, Georgian, Victorian London are clay bricks. If you go to Edinburgh, they will be stone. So it really, uh, in a sense, reifies the kind of geography in which it has uh, arose out of. And I think with, with the shipping container, you could see that with globalization, you know, the de facto material is glass uh, glazing, uh, triple, double, triple glazing and aluminum frames. But I think with uh, the challenge of climate change today, looking at carbon footprint and embodied carbon, we will be we will begin to see uh, on the one hand a certain awareness that material has to be sourced about 20 miles, 25 miles from the site uh, where the building will stand. Uh, in a sense, in, in terms of a creative and, and, and committed uh, design agenda, or the other hand, as we already see in most cities today, that is now becoming a regulatory requirement. And that buildings, in a sense, will pretty much return to what I just mentioned with, with regards to yeah, the, 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 uh, the London stock break of London uh, with, and, and, and its architecture. What changes there, though, Chris, I think that's super interesting and, and actually a, a really nice horizon to think about. But what changes is the modes of construction have changed along with the shipping ca container. And can we return to the modes of construction for those in the, the indigenous materials? No, I think I think there's there's a separation. You're absolutely right, Sarah. Spot on there. I think there is. Uh, most materials today are mass produced. Yeah, but it also doesn't mean that, uh, let's say, bricks were not mass produced to a certain degree, right? Or let's say timber, if we use timber, they are not mass produced. So perhaps we will not use timber as, as it was used, uh, let's say, uh, 100 years ago. We are now using timber that is far more uh, efficient in terms of its structural uh, structural strength, its its, uh, its workability, in terms of uh, glue laminate timber and 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 uh, cross laminated timber. So I think this to me is an opportunity because in a way it allows us to think about carbon footprint and to to formulate a perhaps a new architectural grammar that is both has a certain ecological uh, ambition within it, but also one that sets up a new relationship between material and place, right? And in a way, move away from the kind of, uh, again, exoticization of craftsmanship that may or may no longer be in the cities that we live in anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, no, thanks. Can I... Fact, Mm -hmm. Sorry, Nicola, you want to go ahead and I'll, I'll... Well, I just want to say that I really think it's very interesting and very important what Chris is saying about shifting the discussion towards construction techniques, for example, and responses to climate conditions as a way of developing a language rather than, and, and this has not just been a problem with postmodernism, but architecture in general, taking the conversation away from questions of vernacular versus modernity. And I think that also addresses another problem, which is the whole issue of modernity and what it really means now that people have started to challenge the enlightenment and, and the whole history of it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a um, very important to note that shift. And I think it's very interesting as a way to understand how we could possibly move forward without engaging things that actually in terms of the cultural wars become very tricky. I mean, I'm reminded of a conversation uh, with, um, uh, it was Miron Benevisti, who was then the mayor of um, uh, Jerusalem, saying that, you know, if we could treat this just as ground instead of areas that are just um, soaked in the blood of history, we wouldn't have an issue in terms of making these decisions. And I think architecture suffers from the same kind of problem is that this idea that everything embodies some kind of cultural value that has to be defended or attacked. And I think that there's it's a, it's a very um, interesting position in terms of A, responding to really fundamental challenges, but also responding to them in a way that um, in some ways avoids some of the problems that have become um, so difficult for architecture in the last half century. Thank you. No, let me let me jump in. Uh, Sarah, 
we should have had this discussion before the issue. This is so exciting. <laughs> Start <laughs> all over a <laughs> whole. <laughs> so, yeah, no, but this is very exciting. Thank you all. And, you know, I, I want to kind of, well, I think what you were saying towards the end, both Nikolai and, and Chris, you know, this, this notion that architecture is not a movable feast. The Silk Road made music a movable feast, but not architecture can't do mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of really an interesting thought worth contemplating. But I want to kind of, uh, this might sound a bit disjointed, but inspired by all three of you speaking, and there were a few common issues that sort of emerged, which I really want to highlight. And then I want to ask a question. You know, Chris, uh, uh, you know, that, that culture map was wonderful. Uh, and, uh, you know, and what I, when I looked at it, I, of course, naturally, my instinct was to look for India, which was very yeah. absent. And then I, I thought, my God, you know, those wonderful maps that come out of Michigan where they weigh uh, the proportions of, for housing for X, Y, and Z. If mm -hmm. you actually proportion that cultural map with population, you'd get a completely different visual configuration, right? Uh, which is which is interesting and worth thinking about because, you know, it also leads to many things uh, Nikolai kind of alluded to. Uh, I, 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 you know, I like that observation, Nikolai, where you say, well, you didn't use the word global cities, but how cities draw resources, and they also tend to draw intellectual capital. And therefore, what we perpetuate, whether it's pedagogy, policy, and L, uh, comes out of experiences of big cities that are drawing both intellectual as well as economic uh, capacities and resources. And that's why what's interesting for me, and I always talk to my students about this is, you know, in the last four or five decades before global city became this sort of uh, imaginary, you know, we had world cities, Peter Hall, which also disproportionately controlled cultural, economic, and, you know, other resources. Uh, and then you had global cities, uh, which didn't if they they were really so premised on global capital uh, that sometimes you know dublin qualified as a global city and mumbai never did and therefore even though this came out of the world bank and imf and these sorts of resources we kind of turn an eye to uh, the mega city definition which uses the human being as a metric in some ways is very useful because then that leads i think to your second observation um nicola which is uh how can we then operate maybe on these fringes? And I think to Anel's point of the political uh, policy, et cetera, those are, those are spaces of, very lit of less resistance and greater alignment um, because one can build those relationships as you very beautifully uh, articulated both in your piece in the magazine, but also just now, Nikolai. And you know that leaves you to kind of uh, think about uh, the, the notion that we, our, our imaginary is premised very much on aggregation. Uh, and so what does disaggregation as the counterpoint to that to mean, even in terms of an urban imaginary, uh, right? And I think, uh, Anel, you're alluding to the informal, you're alluding to the dissipation of the rural urban binary, uh, all points uh, challenges us to think about that, uh, about uh, whether we are privileging the notion of aggregation in our imaginary of cities and, and therefore architecture and all of that. And the question I have, mainly for Chris, but I mean, Nicolai and Anel, I would love to hear your response, is the question of scale, therefore. You know, you end your presentation with a beautiful house and a little center uh, in, in India made of mud and bamboo. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and capital is impatient and capital is, um, you know, rides roughshod over everything. Uh, it can become patient when it resides in foundations. It can become patient when it resides on these peripheral locations where different alignments are needed. And so is, is the kind of polarity we've created, will it inherently challenge the scalar question? Which means, can we really, I mean, can we go beyond uh, a little house or a small institution to demonstrate uh, how uh, these alternate modes uh, of material alignment, political, cultural, social alignments uh, can give us better answers. I mean, I'm just looking for a reflection. Yeah. 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 No. No, Rahul. That that's that's a very good question and 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 a very good uh, uh, reading of of what I presented. So, 
Coming back to your question, um, I pres uh, I showed uh, basically two small scale project, and then before that another two sort of mid scale project. One has to deal with uh, the issue of operational energy. Therefore, it's about you know breathing and heat and, and relation to heat. The other one has to do with embodied carbon and with regards to the way in which we need to reduce the energy in the making. Um, but uh, but before that, that, that's that's one of my two parts that I said. Uh, with, with the way in which we could deal uh, with uh, designs uh, uh, relationship to place. And the first one I was alluding to was actually Rossi uh, in, in the way in which we think about, and this is, I think, could in a way bridge the kind of larger scale that, uh, that you're talking about. And I think it's sort of uh, is, is encapsulated in this theme or word that I call being accommodative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is important because I thought that uh, why architects always look to the city in a way to revalidate architectural relevance. Rossi did that in the 70s. Ram did that also about five years later. Rossi looked to the historical city. Ram looks to the metropolis, right? One look backward, one looks forward, but nevertheless tries to revalidate uh, architectural relevance by looking at the at at, uh, at, at the reconceptualization, what is the idea of the city? Now, why that reconceptualization of the city is important, and I think I share their, their, their concerns and also uh, their, their love for the city is because I think as architects, as urbanists and, and planners, I think the city is still as, uh, as a model of space of the space of coexistence par excellence, right? The city is the culmination of um, civilization's artifact that comes about through the negotiate, uh, through negotiation, through the resolution of conflict and differences, right? And if we can find a way in which the city allows that difference to be engaged to be resolved it allows different voices to be included then i think we are closer to finding both an idea as well as the tools and examples to work on a much larger scale okay. yeah yeah no, and, I, and I, as yeah it, Rahul, please it, no no and just to add to that just to again bring anel and uh, nikolai into this is i mean i think you know i, I mean one could almost say what can we learn from those peripheries and therefore what we can potentially learn is the construction of alternate production ecologies right which are about these alignments and bring them back to the city right i think the city in perpetuating its own project has forgotten those alternate means which the peripheries i think informing us in greater terms right that's why we are alluding to as nikolai pointed out the projects we're celebrating are now on the peripheries yeah although well, I have to say, my, my worry about this discussion is that, is that you know, I, I, I mentioned this in passing, but if you look at the, what neoliberalism has done to the kind of the historical metropolis, it's not a great model. I mean, if you look at Paris, if you look at New York, Paris is a city now of two million people or two and a half inside the peripherique and eight to 10 million people outside the peripherique. Okay. And they have no relationship other than the fact that the people outside the peripherique come in to clean the city, do the laundry, work in the kitchens, and then leave if they have jobs. And so the city that we fantasize about as architects is a city of Baudelaire, right? It's a city of the, the seediness of the city. I mean, it's the city that was embraced in a way by Rem's generation, because if you couldn't reform the city the way the modernists had hoped to, you can celebrate the kind of the difference, the collisions of different ethnic groups of different you know, political factions, the frictions that make it a living place. And that, that was something worth celebrating. And these were the places, of course, where modernism was born. And it was, they were important in all the ways, you know, that you just mentioned. I mean, if you were, in the most important way is if you were, let's say, you know, gay living in Texas in 1970, there was a reason you went to New York or San Francisco and LA, because the cities really were able to absorb difference. They provide anonymity. That doesn't happen in the same way. On some level, yes, New York City is still considered, you know, a, a, a liberal state within what's happening to this country. On the yeah. other hand, living here, it's very different than it was when I got here 40 years ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the breakdown of that is one of the things that terrifies me in terms of I don't understand how architecture can cope with those that breakdown. 
So I, I do think that the center cities have become these enclaves of unbelievable wealth, all of the, the large central primary cities. Um, and the periphery, I think, indeed has the, the workers in it. But I think what we're actually witnessing now as of not that long, maybe the last five years, is um, what vestige we have of a middle class is moving to that same periphery. And so I actually think that mm. there is a site of mixing, which is a site not of the central city and, and our, you know, Baudelairean imagination, which I agree, I still hold dear to my heart as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think you know, there you're getting a mixing in a context that wasn't necessarily well built, and so will probably be renewed as um, space and form in the edges, so the outer edges of all of these big cities. But I also want to let Anel come back in mm -hmm. um, uh, on this topic. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sarah, and I'm so sorry for dropping in and out. We understand. Um, it's globalization. But while I am, yeah, <laughs> I think I would use this opportunity also to say something about pedagogy, because a great hobby of mine at the moment, and this is coming through in my piece in the magazine as well, is the fact that um, there was this world celebration, um, at least from a law and policy perspective, when SDG 11 made it into the sustainable development goals and the celebration of, yes, cities are going to become resilient, safe, inclusive, and sustainable between now and 2030. And then when you look at those sub targets, um, it, it, it speaks to, to a uniform city, the one that we are actually talking about now, without making incredibly important distinctions between the, the building blocks of what, because that speaks to well-being, if you think about it. People want to live sustainable, safe, um, and, and resilient lives, and they want to feel part. They, they want to feel that they are included. But the very basic building blocks of, of that sense of well-being are actually still absent or is actually deteriorating in many parts of the world, even there where there's war at the moment. It's not only about socioeconomic collapse or economic downturn. It, it's also about areas in, in our world that's that's being affected by war. Um, so for pedagogy, I think from an outsider's perspective, I would really like to call for more um, less conceptualized and, le and, and I mean, I'm guilty as charged. I'm also very conceptual as a lawyer and, and as someone talking about um, um, governance. But we need more case studies. We need intensive um, deeply rooted empirical case studies um, to feed into our understanding of urbanization, urban development, urban sprawl, and and somewhere in the in some parts of the world, even shrinking cities. That's a huge thing in South Africa at the moment. We see the hollowing out of smaller towns that have been built on carbon intensive mining industries, for example. Um, and, and, and we need to understand those dynamics, but we can really under, only understand it through very carefully designed research initiatives. And, and I think we should be cautious of blue skies research, um, and, and that will feed into our teaching inevitably, um, regardless of our fields of, of study and background. I think that's a really important point, um, the, the specificity of these examples. And, and for us as designers, understanding that examples have policy and um, uh, regulations that underlie them, that they're not just examples of a beautiful handrail. Um, and it's completely separate from how the, the context of the place that it's in, in terms of those regulations. Before we go to audience questions, I wanted really just quickly because the pedagogy was one of the things that obviously we're interested in. And Nikolai, you you didn't really speak so much to pedagogy, so I wonder if we can rope you in on that one before. I know we have audience questions coming in, so just really briefly. Well, just briefly, I think that there is this. Well, I think this last point about case studies, counter proposals, really digging into. Um, you know, language and not in terms of the language and the way it's misused often in architecture, that these are things that really have to be scrutinized. And 
people have to challenge more directly and more um, head on because there's a kind of a, there is a real blue sky kind of uh, sloppiness, I think, to the way um, architecture is taught and discussed now. And part of it is understandable because I think that architects have become so marginalized in terms of the um, control that the profession has over things like urbanization, you know, so that if you're working in the context, uh, the context that we're talking about, you know, the sphere in terms of how, where you're allowed to act is so limited now that it's, it's, it's understandable why so many architects are obsessed with form because that's what you're allowed to do. It's not necessarily, not just because that's what students are obsessed with. It's just a place where you actually are free. Um, and I think that, so there's this kind of parallel track, you know, and I think that, I think that this is something that the schools can begin to try or sh should try to address more aggressively. And I think part of it is acknowledging and really, really, really confronting what the limits are that we face as architects and thinkers now and not, um, I, I think there's this um, tendency to, you know, not just hide behind a wall of jargon, but kind of bury our heads in the sand because it, we feel helpless on some level. Um, you know, when we talk about, for example, you know, the West versus the global South, I mean, the most obvious thing in the world right now is that it's the global South that's gonna suffer most from climate change. And the global North that has all the resources, you know, and we should be, that money should be going to the global south. And if it did, that would have all kinds of implications for urbanization or, you know, and architecture. But these things aren't happening. So I think there's a real understandable frustration and a tendency to, um, in this kind of a political climate, there's a kind of a tendency towards escapism, maybe. You know, and I think that it's important to fight that. And in that sense, I am an optimist because I do think that there's that fight is going on. I think people really are starting to challenge, you know, where architecture has been going, especially a younger generation of architects, um, uh, younger generations in general, at least the educated ones, are really starting to challenge a lot of the most basic assumptions that we've been carrying around with us for the last 50 years. The, Technology, for example, and our complete, you know, naive idea that technology is associated with progress, you know, which anyone who, you know, experienced again modernism from the other end knows that technology is actually, from the experience of some peoples, is all about violence. So I think those kinds of discussions will have an impact on architecture, but I think that there's a need within the profession to really kind of confront those questions and acknowledge where we're at, basically. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, no, it it does, and I just sort of, I mean, I just to frame that another way because it, it it absolutely is bang on. Is I think the way I understood it and I've often articulated it is our actually our spheres of concern are expanding exponentially, and we're articulating those concerns better and better. But our spheres of influence are diminishing exponentially, and mm -hmm. we quite don't know how to expand or calibrate them. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, I think that is the most urgent question for pedagogy uh, is, is how does one bring back those influences? So the case studies theory from the South, I mean, really reflecting on where the action is on the ground is the need of the hour uh, for us to inform, you know, the next generation. But with that, I'm going to go to the next generation. And there's a question from the audience from Natasha Harrison. Uh, she is an MAUD, MLAUD uh, student, and she asks if, uh, we consider that architecture is the frame that allows global and local to interact temporarily, then how could large scale infrastructure play a role in accommodating social justice? Anel, you wanna attempt? That? I was wondering whether that one is for me, seeing justice there. Thank you very much, Natasha, for the question. And I think it's a very valid one. And I would like to flip it around a little bit by asking what sits behind these large scale infrastructure projects? I think that is an important question to be asked because often we see international flow of money, there's, there's investors involved, 
there's relationships between governments and, and specific investors and so on. But in short, I fully agree with you that um, it can be a vehicle, large scale infrastructure projects for improved um, social justice, because we sit with energy poverty in many parts of the world still, we sit with the digital divide. So large scale infrastructure projects, we, if we think about the concrete and, and the hard infrastructure, the built environments got a purpose to serve, but there's forces behind it that, that might actually be deepening social injustices Hey, um, Chris or Nikolai, do you want to jump in on, on this same question while we reconnect with Anel? I mean, I would just add that there's a, you know, infrastructure, I think the two areas actually re really are um, places where a progress is really possible in terms of engaging the political infrastructure and preservation in a way are probably the two where, um, are the easiest in a way. Um, infrastructure, because uh, it's happening, obviously. Um, and if you look at things, you know, like the story of the National Highway Defense Act in the United States and how it was used to destroy black neighborhoods, isolate black neighborhoods from white neighborhoods, I think there's a an understanding within the world of architecture now that, that's quite um, uh, clear understanding of how infrastructure can both bind communities together and separate them, how it can operate in destructive ways. And it's the kind of discussion where I think it's a lot easier to engage a mass public with, in terms of those sorts of issues, in terms of being able to talk about them in a way that people can understand, you know, how the built environment really affects them. Um, so I think you know, it's a fascinating subject in terms of ways in which architects could again begin to, you know, this is the problem is just also engaging the public again, you know, mm -hmm. because that and that gets into a whole issue of what's happened to journalism and magazines and everything else. But um, I think that we have to find a way, a different way to engage the public. And I think infrastructure is an interesting starting point. It also, I think, infrastructure jumps in at, at different scales and and um, breaks out. You know, I think we have very interesting case studies of cities that are at the edges of nations. I mean, even if you think of um, uh, Basel, is sort of almost three countries mm -hmm. in one, and and there are examples all over the world, right? That that bridges and so the infrastructures the hard infrastructures play a role in sort of breaking down what is national and what is local and then of course other forms of infrastructure have um, introduced different spatial understandings as well um chris did you want to jump in on this or or yeah yeah maybe very quickly uh also what what rahul also has said was was spot on with regards to the diminishing uh and also the exponentially mm -hmm. expanding things that we need to look at and and i think i'm a little bit more optimistic than nikolai mm -hmm. i think uh, um we are doing that actually uh, i think architects today at least my generation i think we are heavily involved in all scales when we practice uh, you can only look at let's say in singapore where architects are always consulted in close collaboration with planners uh, of the city urban redevelopment authority and we design collaboratively make decisions collaboratively consulted uh, quite closely and you see a range of uh, um, uh, public goods are enacted on all scales, right? From, let's say, coming to the infrastructure, ecological infrastructure, blue and green network that has transformed the entire city, biodiversity corridor that traversed the entire island, for instance. And all this would not have happened if, let's say, architects are not able to understand and speak the language of ecology, sustainability, urban planning, and also material harnessing material uh, and, and, and resources together. So I think there is a growing generation that are incredibly uh, aware of this range of awareness that will make the kind of structure, infrastructure, bridging the scales that Rahul is talking about. And in my response to the question, I was also alluding that 
this this kind of intellectual accommodation that we realize that we need to transcend our disciplinary knowledge definitely beyond form making to make this kind of meaningful change is very, very important and but on the global scale i think that it's even more important because i think that to 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 make it very very short and blunt is that i think western neoliberal globalization is in a way challenge very severely and perhaps coming to an end and we will be looking at a multi polar world in which different spheres of influence operate with a very particular philosophical and cultural paradigm that sometimes i think in the west we take for granted and are unable to make those judgment what we feel as good architecture promoted by el croquis promoted by other magazines in the west is very very narrow and and 1 billion people in china together with the state they see architecture values and architecture what what fits to become a good architecture is very very different and i think we are just scratching the surface of trying to understand that now when i say that we need to be accommodative intellectually as well as in terms of our material practice is precisely this that we are able to bridge this gap especially when we see the world is about to splinter into multipolar and worse to a bipolar world Thank you. Just very quickly, we are running out of time. I know, but you know, Anel, we lost you for the last few words. But what you were saying made me think about um, you know what one of our contributors for the magazine, Arjun Apudarai, once in 1990, I was listening to a lecture when India was beginning to embrace neoliberalism and all of that, and he he called infrastructure the weapons of mass construction uh, because that's what they were doing in the way you were talking about separating. Uh, communities and you know to chris and nikolai's sort of uh, responses i mean i think really the challenge is how we embed infrastructure in our imagination within communities and design can bring dimensions like moving away from monofunctional infrastructure which allows it to embrace communities in ways uh, we can leverage resources in a sense right so i mean i think that's where design could play a very critical role so you know thank you for those wonderful responses sarah over to you well we we do only have a couple minutes left but um, we would be remiss if we didn't offer the three of you the chance to ask, ask your own questions of one another or or frankly of us i'll just say i'll make a comment um, just to jump in, which is not so much a question, but just that I feel much more optimistic after this conversation than when I started it. So thank you, everyone, for that. Anel, do you have some closing <laughs> comments? Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I'm not feeling negative or positive about the globalization <laughs> of urban governance that I've been written about, uh, writing about. All I can say is that what I see in, in a country like the one that I'm finding myself in is that there is this aspiration um, to have Cape Town look and feel like London, New York, um, and, and the base parts of it, not the, not the bad parts, which often also there is. But then there's also a, a really a strong turn to, to heritage and to the indigenous idea of the use of materials and using own labor, using own knowledge about the strength of certain materials and so on. And this is also a lovely experience to see parts of the country going one way and other parts the other way. And this is across socioeconomic divides and racial as well. Um, it's 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 about what people like and, and how they like to feel in the space, which is determining which route they want to go. And, and that, uh, that's exciting. And I think this magazine is exci exciting, the specific edition. Um, and I look very much forward to reading everybody's contribution. Chris. No, I, I, I pretty much said what, what I needed to say. And I think uh, I'm so pleased that, uh, you know, uh, Rahul and Sarah, you brought up this uh, topic of globalization because it's so apt. And I always think so is because uh, I think this, the generation of students that we teach today are globalized. Uh, I think we can't find a certain individual in which have not spent 
part of their lives or many part of their lives in different in different places in different cities and i think our the, the students today and and the generation today are incredibly in a sense uh, lucky and in a sense also with great responsibility to be a global actor through design and, and i think it's spot on uh, what is being raised today and and i'm and i'm really happy for that very quickly, Sarah, just to, I mean, Anel sort of comments, just triggered off a thought, which also connected to something Nikolai said, which is how architects begin to get obsessed with form because that's all they feel they can control. And I think Anel, in your, the way I would describe what you were articulating is the tyranny of images, right? Which perpetuates imaginaries. Uh, and Johannesburg wants to look like Singapore and then the village near Johannesburg wants to look like Johannesburg, et cetera. And, and I think really, uh, I think I think education can play and uh, pedagogy can play a big role in kind of deconstructing that imaginary uh, because images are something we really dwell with and perpetuate as architects and um, with social media and all of that today it's perpetuated even more uh, and I think southern theory and looking at pedagogy and architecture around the world can inform that project quite substantially so thank you for pointing that out both. I think what's interesting there is, um, yes, we, we traffic in images. I would say architects traffic in images even more than trafficking in form now. Yeah, so the cliche of architects are only obsessed with form, to be honest, I think is outdated um, and has become this image obsession. Um, what I think where I where my I harbor my optimism. So I think architects actually have to be optimistic because you traffic in the future and and academics have to be optimistic because we traffic in the future through our students. So I have to I have no choice, right? I have to be optimistic. And I I do think today what what I feel came out of from this conversation and I think is something that we wanted the issue to articulate but I wonder if it's actually only in this conversation that it came clear is um, I would argue uh, we're seeing a sort of mature interdisciplinarity. Um, interdisciplinarity has been a, a dream that sort of coincided with the rise of globalization and I think has always been something that's very easy to talk and actually quite hard to pull off except in very superficial forms. And I think what we're seeing in this conversation, and I hope having a, um, a, a group of students that with the sense of responsibility that they bring to us and we see in them, that the interdisciplinarity that they will rot is one uh, of specificity. And so I, you know, I really think it's great that Anel brought up the case study or precedent issue, which is something that we use a lot. But um, the, I think in, introducing the specificity that comes from your field, um, introducing that into our field, I think um, will yield some some really amazing results. So this this leaves me um, very happy. I really appreciate the time that you all put into your contributions as well as this conversation. Uh, I too am looking forward to the issue. It'll be a little bit before we see it, but we're hoping that we'll we'll have them by the end of May. So. Um, thank you very much. And we're ending two minutes late. That's not too bad for, for GSD. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. A nice meeting. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.